Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. It is uh, my pleasure to come to this beautiful city of Istanbul. It has, I have been here several times, usually to consult some old manuscripts uh, accompanying my husband. Uh, so this time it's, uh, I'm for the first time in my own capacity. I'm impressed about the multitude of nationalities and this uh, distinguished conference. Uh, coming from various regions and uh, presenting a very rich and diverse uh, number of topics. Where I come into the story is I come as a higher education specialist. I want to give you this context so that you know that uh, my specialty is not education at large, but what I'm really interested in and what I usually work on is universities or other types of higher education institutions and students. And that would be anyone 18 plus, basically, those that are enrolled in the higher education. Uh, I do belong to social sciences in multiple ways. I have done my BA in economics, my PhD in political science, and I'm with the Department of Sociology. So I guess I do belong uh, to, the, to the social sciences largely. But again, I approach uh, the to only and specifically the topic of higher education. And this is also something that I hope will bind you in this next 45 minutes that we have together. Uh, and that is the question of students, higher education students. And the topic that I really would like to discuss with you is the question of university citizenship and how students, university students, relate to their universities. So this is the, the broader context that I hope that you can fit in in this very early morning. And for us, some of us, it is still very early in the morning, uh, our biological clocks. Uh, so, so that's, uh, and this is the topic just that, to give you a little bit of a background. Uh, I'm, uh, I work on students and I work on the, on the question on how contemporary higher education reforms affect students and how they affect the relationship between the students and their universities. Before I go to the next first slide, I'll maybe begin with a story. Um, two years ago, I was conducting a field research in a small country of Montenegro. And what we did there is with a team of researchers, we were questioning how, what kind of a higher education reforms are going on there and what's happening to, to the country, what, what are the changes in higher education. We did this as a part of a larger project in the Western Balkans. So I went there as a researcher conducting interviews uh, with uh, rectors and deans and with the uh, ministry officials and with the quality assurance officials. And among them, I also interviewed students. One ought to also discuss it with students, how they experience the higher education reforms. So I asked the students what we usually ask. So what's the situation for the students in Montenegro? Um, what are the conditions of study? How much influence or power do you have in your universities to influence the decisions or change things? Things like that. But among uh, the questions that I ask as well is, towards the end of the interview, is what are the, some of the activities, large activities that you have done lately and that you have been very proud of? And then suddenly the student representatives lighten up and said, you know, we had this very important action just a month ago. Montenegro had a terrible snowstorm this year. So there was a week where everything was closed, the schools, the universities, the streets, and we got students to shovel snow. More than 100 volunteered and were taking the shovels and shoveled around the uh, university, uh, around the student dormitories. Some went even away and shoveled around the, 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 the schools. And uh, it, was a, it was a voluntary action. And I thought, that's very really interesting. They, they said, well, the media took a notice, and we were in the newspapers. And it was just one of these very inspiring, wonderful activities we did. A month later, I went back uh, to Boston, and I happened to have a similar talk uh, like I have here today at Boston College. And after my talk, I sit with the provost uh, at Boston College, and I'm telling him this about my Montenegrin experience, uh, and how students were telling me about shoveling the snow around the university. And then the provost says, you know, we actually try to do something the same 
Uh, Boston College is a small Jesuit university of 14,000 students. Uh, Boston that year was also snowed in and there were several school closures and we had approximately two meters of snow. And I asked the pro, so what happened? You, know, you asked the students to come and help with snow shoveling because you didn't get enough uh, workers because everyone needed uh, people to help them. So how many did volunteer? What do you think? And any guesses from 14,000 students, how many students at Boston College volunteered uh, to shovel snow? None? One. <laughs> one. Only one. Only one. So let's, um, you know, let's ponder this little bit. One. Now I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there are different uh, uh, organizational cultures or university cultures. There are different national cultures in terms of what it means, the relationship between students and their universities, and uh, the questions about what is the role of students when universities. And this is really the topic that I would like to discuss with you today. This is really something that I do as part of my, my study. So I would be really interested to hear from your side. How do you feel about the question? Should the university ask uh, students to shovel snow for, for them? Who, who says yes? Who says yes? Maybe just hands up now. Who says yes? And who feels not really? Why not? Why uh, not? Okay. Let, let me hear a little bit. Yes. Uh, let me um, hear your thoughts I, about that. I, I think <clears throat> it's more dependent to the, the way things are organized there. Because in West Europeans, they are also some kinds of what they call the insurance. If the students come and, for example, break leg, who's going to pay for that. Whereas in Montenegro, I can imagine there is a sensitive of citizenship and forthcoming nationalism coming. So I think the way perception of and the way systems work differs from okay, two countries. There is a concern about liability that university would have exactly. for the insurance. Yeah. So yeah. any other thoughts about that? We have somebody here. Can I pass along? Okay. And the lady behind? Uh, I can't. Lady behind first, and then it's yours, OK? <laughs> uh, yes, I think that the students can do that when they feel that they are belong to their society. I think that we cannot discuss citizenship as um, you know, just a separate feelings for the students and ask them to do a lot of things for the societies without feeding them that they are a part of their societies. So uh, we cannot talk about the universities, you know, just as a separate entity, mm -hmm. uh, something in the sky or coming from the sky. Uh, students are part of their societies. So I think that is a positive correlations between, you know, just uh, encouraging students to do something for their societies and the role of the universities in doing something for the societies itself. Thank you. So the sense of belonging, the sense of belonging to the wider society, but also the way that I understand is the sense of belonging to the university, being a member of the university community. Okay, we have, we had the gentleman here as well. Gentlemen here, hello, hello. Okay, gentlemen here, so that we don't okay. do the, some gender uh, disparities here, <laughs> please. <laughs> Okay, now it's my turn. Uh, thank you for this topic and I'm um, glad to be here. Uh, my name is Abdullah Al-Smadi. I'm uh, from Jordan and coming from Bahrain. Uh, well, I understand the voluntary issue uh, is in emergency cases, yes. I don't know nothing about uh, Monte Gamera, but uh, Boston, how much it, does it snow in the year? Like two months, three months? Mm -hmm. it, it's not going to be legitimate to ask students f to be volunteer for this long time. Uh, in Jordan, yes, we have snow, but it's uh, like uh, three, two, three times a year. Yes, that's logic to have something, uh, somebody to be volunteering for. Uh, so uh, your, your argument is yes, in case of emergency. Yes, snow, uh, but it's not. It's not like a systematic uh, uh, yeah. case. Okay. How about let me change the story a little bit. How about asking uh, students, uh, uh, offering students a paying, you know, uh, not volunteering to shovel snow, but we will pay you. Is that an acceptable thing to do? Just wondering, what do you feel? We will, uh, university offers mm -hmm. actually, and just a little caveat, Boston College actually offered to pay students. 
and one came. So how about that? Let's just, uh, let's just, uh, uh, one question. Maybe somebody else. Would somebody yes, else sir. hear it? the gentleman from Iraq and Libya? I understand. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I think this is something related to the culture of the society. I mean, usually we do this uh, with the uh, with the primary. I mean, schools in the primary schools, we ask the the pupils to work together. So the idea is uh, concerning the cooperation. So if that uh, behavior, you, I mean, work on that. Definitely in the university, it will be something normal to do it. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that in Malaysia. In fact, I graduated from Malaya University. And I lived in Malaysia for seven years. I know that uh, the Malaysians, I mean, cooperate in the university in a strange way. I mean, they help each other. So the moment they ask for something, they all volunteer. So I was about to say, I mean, 80% when you say only one. Because I think this behavior is great, I mean, to be, I mean, applicable in the university. So I think education it starts from the very beginning. When you plant this in the student's mind, definitely that will be very easy for them to cooperate. So, so for payment, I'm, I, I don't like the idea at all. You don't like the idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, that sounds so. Okay. The message Thank here you. is starting early, uh, the spirit of coll collaboration, engagement with your own community, in, in that case being the school and then continuing that into the... Okay. Making them feel that university or the school is their home, that it's part of their community. All right, uh, we have a few more, and then I'll be moving the story, and then we come to this so that the, <laughs> the, the right side is not left out. <laughs> well, I am from Italy, and I think in Italy the only problem is bureaucracy. Someone will say these uh, have no insurance, so a problem of liability of the university. On the other hand, when these kind of problems happen, the students don't want to be paid. They want to help. I, I remember I was a child 50 years ago. We had a big flooding in Florence and all the students were involved in rescuing books from libraries and so on. And more recently we had a terroristic attack to the Academy of Agriculture and all the students of agriculture were involved uh, to rescue the volumes of the historical library and no one was thinking of the insurance and no one thinking was thinking of paying the students. They just got a sort of diploma that they had done that for the benefit of the community and that's was all. Nice story. How about we had, the, we had here, and I'll take a couple of more, and then the gentleman there, and then we're moving on, okay? Right. Um, I've had the benefit of schooling in Africa and in Europe, so I know that culture definitely has something to do with it. Um, but in my little time in Oxford, um, there was this bonding where people felt they were part and parcel of the community. Um, it may not be in the terms of, of shoveling snow, but in terms of doing the boat race um, mm -hmm. with Cambridge and all the other places, mm -hmm. they felt they were doing it for the community. Mm -hmm. and, um, and each time they won, they, they came home with pride that mm -hmm. they've done something for the community. Mm -hmm. So I think it just varies, but I think it's still entrenched in, in the culture of the place. The gentleman here is invoking very powerful uh, definitions here, that of uh, ownership of the university, being yeah. defined by the universities, all of the central aspect of the sense of belonging, belonging to one's community. Wonderful. There is a comment at the back as well. Yes, thank you very much. I'm from the United States, but I've been teaching in Japan for a number of years. And I noticed, uh, going on from your comments, the earlier comments here, um, first of all, it, it, I think it depends in part on the relationship that the university establishes with the students themselves. And I've noticed in Japan that uh, there's a, some interpret it as a kind of paternalism. There's a certain, uh, I guess, a more personal relationship that they try to cultivate with the students and there's a, a feeling that they will take care of the students. And I think the students reciprocate in that way and feel more a part of the university community. And so I think that there's a, a strong cultural and traditional element that's involved in establishing a relationship between student and, and university. So in the United States, I think that um, students would be, at this time anyway, uh, less inclined to feel part of a university community somehow. And I think that comment earlier about uh, the litigious uh, aspect of the whole relationship between the university and the student, whereby a student, if he were to fall or have an accident while shoveling snow, the parents might be inclined to sue the university. Mm -hmm. And for example, in Japan, that wouldn't happen as a general rule. 
very nice contrast. And this is exactly where, where I was hoping we will be coming to, and that is these different cultural conceptions of students. Uh, and whether students are, how students are conceived within the university, are they pupils uh, that have to be taught and controlled and disciplined? Uh, are they pupils that are part of this common home uh, to which they belong, a school of the university? Are they clients, customers, uh, to whom we provide a service only? Um, and how that different conception of students uh, translates into the relationship between the student and the university and between the teacher and, uh, and the student themselves. So this is one of the bigger discussions. I will be now proceeding a little bit more into the lecture part, but you have uh, given wonderful examples and we'll come back to the discussion a little bit as I lay down some of the, some of the questions. So in my research, uh, the basis of uh, the research that we find with students, there is one central tension. And the central tension really is, is the conception of students as a passive recipients uh, uh, of knowledge or educational service or active participants in higher education. And this, this tension can be even extended further into the passive, uh, into the question of their passivity or activity in also other activities, not only within the classroom. And this is what we have now discussed, being engaged with the, uh, with the higher education community, uh, involving civically or only accepting the service and then leaving uh, the university premises. So there's some of the, in the literature, we would find this question, are students to people to whom things are done? They are taught. Or are people who are learning to do things and do things for themselves within the university environment? Are they subjects or are they masters of their own learning and self-formation? And then the further question is how students meet their ample desires, how they become. Because studentship is at the end of the day about becoming. It is the route of passage to some other new state or new status. And, uh, and how they construct their studentship, their being a student while they're embedded in higher education community. One of the places where this tension comes out very powerfully is in student surveys. I don't know, probably in all of the you know, student surveys or student questionnaires are now becoming very popular. I wonder, do you do them? Do you ask students how satisfied they are with courses? Or uh, you do? Is there anyone who doesn't do student surveys? Any, any of the universities here where you don't ask students how happy they are or not anywhere? You, do, you don't, or you do? Uh, no, I, no, I do. You do? I always. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, you know, um, that asking students, and uh, let's say, uh, higher, higher, higher education students, as to whether you are happy or disciplined for some subjects, it's so important because it will give them some, some kind of, say, a sort of, uh, say, you know, that it's the close relationship between the master, I mean, the teacher, and the hmm. students, that give them also a confidence that you are. You are, you are so, let's say, you are okay in your study, you are, uh, we, can, we can rely on you. So it's a matter of confidence between, I, between the student and the teacher. It's a matter of feeling of the Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so we, it has been now established that one of the ways that they're getting the feedback from the students on how they experience what is happening to them, it's a useful part of the, of the part of the quality assurance within higher education. But there has been, there have been an interesting development. The student survey started off with the questions, how satisfied are you with the higher education provision? How satisfied on the scale from one to five, how satisfied are you with the quality of your libraries? Or on the scale of one to five, how satisfied are you with the attention that you get or support that you get from your professor? Or how satisfied are you with the difficulty uh, of the course, uh, or the course material, etc., etc. Now, the, the movement in the student service has been from the satisfaction into the student engagement. Because the new scholarship is saying we should look at this, not only whether students are satisfied what is happening to them, but also what they are actually doing. In which ways are they engaging with so-called educationally purposeful activities? So, how often they 
volunteer in class or raise their hand or ask for the questions. So it's, it's from the satisfaction into the engagement. And that shows a little bit that particular tension from the being conceived as passive, as receiving education, towards being conceived as active, co-responsible for their own education. Yes, please. try to a little bit go further on now about this passive and active. Um, this progressive, I mean, you, many of you here in the room are, are uh, educationalists, so you will be very well familiar with, with the terms of progressive education and, and uh, the, the, the tenets of the progressive education. We see more of this progressive education discourse now also with the higher, within the higher education research. Uh, students at the heart of the system. I'm taking this title from the main policy paper within the UK. Uh, it was titled actually as such, Students as a Heart of the System. And the basis of this entire progressive higher education is understanding that the modern democratic societies rely on empowered human agency. Uh, individuals that make choices as consumers, individuals that uh, make choices as voters or uh, take part in the democratic life. Uh, even the cultural life, arts, should be expression of freedom of thinking uh, and of choice. And so this agentic individuals, looking very philosophically, uh, if you like it, are seen as being uh, the basis of the progress and the, uh, and, and the uh, social and economic pro progress of the modern society. So if we step further, if we push the story further, the education institutions then are expected to be helping students or individuals to develop or, or uh, strengthen their agency, their uh, agentic uh, properties in order to be active uh, in their society and, and economy. So this is uh, some of the metaphors that we hear in the higher education discourse now, is students' will, students' choice, freedom, uh, purposefulness, uh, and that's part of that, uh, that new discourse. This is a little bit remote, so I'm going to push uh, further now. Um, and uh, bring out the student-centered approach. Again, if you look at the lower levels of the education sphere, student-centered approach is probably has been there for much longer. Whereas in the higher education, it's only lately becoming more on a policy agenda. Within the European higher education area, which has 47 member states, it is only from the last year that student-centered learning is becoming the primary objective of all of the states to implement in higher education. And what they understand under the student-centered approach is that uh, a new measures are, are put in place which would really try to uh, strengthen the role of the students in the education in the education process, which would uh, make students responsible or co-responsible for their own learning, which would strengthen the partnership between the teachers and the students in deciding what is being taught, how it is being taught, and how students are being assessed. It's, uh, it's changing the paradigm in many ways. Um, not many people yet know how this is all going to be implemented in practice. But the European standards and guidelines for the quality assurance are very firm on when, they, when universities will be assessed for quality assurance, those things will be actually checked. Whether this principle of student-centered learning are being practiced at the universities. Yes, please. Just wanted to add, um, uh, just wanted to add something to what you're saying. Um, in my experience of teaching, uh, I've been able to teach from the secondary school so they lower the, the sixth form and then the university. And what I've noticed 
is that because this did not come sooner, uh, we expect students to go from being spoon-fed in the secondary schools where there are PowerPoints and everything being downloaded mm. to them, mm. to becoming independent learners from uh, in, 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 in the sixth form and then post sixth form. And I saw some of my most intelligent students become dollars by the time they got to sixth form because they just couldn't cope. Right. So mm. I believe that this hopefully at some point, if it can be uh, kick-started okay. much sooner, much okay. earlier, then hopefully by the time they get to university, it might become much more important. This is, a, this is a valuable contribution because what we see, especially some of the problems in the freshman year, in the first year at the university, is exactly that. Coping with, uh, with the self-study skills or how to navigate uh, the university. And it is exactly the first year at the university which is so crucial for students' retention rates, whether they will actually continue or not, for, uh, for their success at studies because they have to, be, they have to understand uh, the system that they are part of, and they have to start developing and consolidating their own study skills. So this is the part of student-centered learning, uh, and I'm moving now of, uh, into the being a student. There are some universal issues about being students, regardless of the culture where you go, about becoming, uh, about the notions of uh, studentship as, a, as becoming, as a rite of passage from one status to another new status. And it's about all of that. Students learning about taking care of themselves uh, in many ways, also physically, uh, before being taken care of by their parents and now living on their own or living in rented apartments or living away from their parents. Uh, learning from being spoon-fed uh, also with knowledge and PowerPoints and now needing to take care of themselves because the amount of uh, material that they have to process is so much, uh, so much larger. Uh, about knowing how to develop and maintain relationships the social aspect is a crucial aspect of adolescence in general, but also part of the studentship. And that is not only a relationship with, uh, uh, let's say, more private relationship, but it's also professional relationships with the teachers, with potential and future employers. Uh, it is about developing identity distinct styles uh, being different in some ways. And we see a lot of that happening on the internet where uh, through the Facebook and, and other social media, students are starting to develop their distinct styles or try to distinguish themselves in some ways from, uh, uh, from the others. It is also about balancing academic, re academic responsibilities with the rest. Uh, maybe a little story on the side of this. Uh, my students last term have done a project in my course on student experience, and they have asked their colleagues on how students uh, divide their time between academic responsibilities, between extracurricular acti activities, and about uh, between employment inducing or strengthening uh, opportunities. Which one gets most of their time? At Harvard, that was. Uh, the responses were probably not something that university was too happy about, because it became apparent that students at Harvard that they have interviewed, uh, mostly from social sciences, have have believed that the extracurricular activities are equally important and often even more important than what's happening in in the classroom, um, because they believe that uh, the, the part of uh, being a student and part of becoming is also cultivating your social capital, which means developing relationships, cultivating your cultural uh, capital, some of it through the extracurricular activities. So a lot of time is spent outside the classroom. So much so that uh, students tend to stretch themselves thin in terms of the number of activities that they uh, engage in. Some of it is, of course, uh, for, for, for uh, their future. I mean, some of this is for the good. They are uh, well-rounded, uh, but it's a question if there is enough challenge, if they are willing to challenge themselves enough also within the classroom. So this is, this is one of the balances that they have to be taking uh, among themselves as well. And then, uh, you know, the two uh, important things as well, and I'll just finish here, is to gain knowledge and to develop skills and uh, to learn 
how to uh, become part of the profession. And that is probably one of the things that we as educators ought to do, and this is part of the student-centered approach, that we help our students to develop relationship with the discipline and through the discipline to the profession that they are studying for. I had a comment here. How many <coughs> of your students from, uh, at Harvard are from the ethnic minorities. Uh, okay. And the perception of the host community and the ethnic minority perceptions differ. Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. In, in my class, concretely, they were only, it would be, I would say, 2%, not more than that, uh, uh, few. But it's not, uh, probably, it's not uh, the reflection of Harvard, uh, Harvard student body in, in general. But the question of how of the sense of belonging uh, that ethnic minorities, or international students if you want it, or women if you want it, uh, uh, how they relate and how they feel that they belong to the community, that's a relevant question. And uh, I don't think Harvard is unique to the, to the movement uh, 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 among the minority students. Uh, we had this uh, huge campaign, I too am Harvard, uh, uh, among the uh, students from ethnic minorities uh, who have been questioning uh, whether, uh, whether there's enough support given to them and whether, uh, in order for them to fully integrate into the entire community. So I think this is one of the questions that is very relevant and persistent in the, in the colleges uh, in the US. I, I can't generalize for all of them, but definitely it was a part of the discussion at Harvard. Um, it was, it's probably also a discussion in the UK colleges that I am, uh, I, I am not now part of. But another question is as well for other, uh, uh, it's also for the international students. Because uh, I don't know if you have read the latest Economist, uh, four million students are studying abroad. This is in some countries, a uh, not large share of the student body is uh, international students. Are they how they are integrated into the into the community of the university? This is also a question. Uh, in which way and what are those mechanisms that help students to feel the sense of belonging? The lady before mentioned it. We'll, we'll get to it. Uh, we still have time, so we'll discuss this exactly on how, and how is what I want to discuss with them, if we, with you in particular, because the concepts we, we know. Um, I, I'll only whisk through the theory of student agency. Um, I have developed this, the theory of student agency because I was hoping that with this conceptual framework, it will help us to study the differences between the different cultures, uh, be that national cultures or institutional cultures, in how students relate uh, with their uh, universities, in which their students can intervene in their higher education environment within universities, uh, uh, and, and what kind of relationship students develop to their universities. So I have uh, defined it as a capability of students to critically shape their responsiveness uh, to an interaction with and within higher education environment for the purposes of self-formation and well-being. I still um, uh, believe in, uh, that higher education is first and foremost about student self-formation. Uh, and it also ought to be about student well-being. Not so much satisfaction, but really well-being. Uh, that they actually, as students, are able to function well uh, within that higher education environment. So I, I give that, but I'm not going to go. And then I uh, defined student agency as a, uh, it having two central dimensions. One, one, uh, one is the student's agentic possibilities, which is really about positive freedoms and possibilities for students to intervene in their environment. And we come back here, like the gentleman was spoke, is speaking earlier, in Japan, the notions and the conceptions that teachers have of their students are their pupils, are their customers, uh, in which way they see them being integrated and belong to the higher education uh, community. And some of the things that define these opportunities are the legal status the students have, uh, are the various, uh, whether they have uh, seats and voting powers in the university decision-making bodies. Uh, it is also, and, and most of it is about university culture, as we discussed before in which ways university understand the students are part of it or not. And then the other part, and this is really which is, gets more difficult, 
will students, so students, one is the question, students can be engaged in the classroom uh, so that they can exercise, uh, whether student-centered uh, approach is exercised, whether they have spaces where they can be engaged, uh, whether somebody invites them to help, uh, to help the university to uh, clean up and preserve the library collections after the terrorist attack, as the gentleman was uh, speaking about Italy, or whether somebody invites them to help with shoveling when the university is snowed in. So this is one, and whether the researcher invites undergraduate students to take part in her or his research. This is about spaces of the engagement and the possibility. But the second and the more difficult question is whether the students will actually want to do it. Whether students will want to be engaged, uh, whether it is with the within the classroom activities or it is outside uh, within the wider university community. And here, uh, some of the things that are usually studied is about this individual's internal responses towards invitation to be engaged. Uh, whether they will be, whether, you know, sometimes people, I, I speak about this student centered learning and uh, inviting students to be co responsible. And then uh, I, I spoke about this in uh, Tbilisi, in Georgia, just uh, in December. And, the, and there were respondents there from Central Asia. And they said, well, I would want them to do, I would want to have a Socratic method with them. And I would like to have them discuss, like you have discussed earlier with me. But I posed the question and there is nothing. There are 300 sitting in the classroom. They don't say a thing, you know, how, how uh, they're passive. They are disinterested. They only think about jobs. Um, what, do you what do you say on that? I mean, how active or passive are your students? This is now a question to you. Is, is, are they really passive or there is something else at stake? There is a lady at the back. And you wanted something as well? If you, no? Not yet. Not yet. Later. Uh, I think they are passive because they are not allowed to think on their own. Uh, they are trained for jobs, which they don't want. I mean, there is money in it, but they are not passionate about it. Uh, so when they come into the university, they have a few options. Uh, they have a few subjects, at least in my place. Uh, they have a few subjects, and uh, these subjects are chosen by their parents or uh, themselves because they might get jobs which are well paid. Right. So, I mean, uh, they are not allowed to study what they are passionate about, so why would they answer? Mm. And this is, the, this is one thing about the availability of the, the subject, subject that they are interested or not interested in. Anything else? Somebody? I had, there's a gentleman. Um, yes. I was also wondering how this relationship has changed over the years. The lady next to me mentioned that uh, students are particularly interested in jobs mm. these days. And I think mm. universities, their whole role, and I, I don't know how it is generally speaking, but it seems to me the role has changed somewhat. And students and parents are demanding more job skill related uh, courses. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, in Japan there's a movement afoot to eliminate uh, humanities programs or liberal arts programs. Well, yeah, yeah. so I think uh, this is something that we also need to take into consideration and from a historical perspective it'd be mm -hmm. interesting to hear uh, how this relationship between student and uh, university has changed over the years too. You're, raising, you're raise, raising a very relevant question, and that is how the contemporary, uh, broader socio-economic situation influences the choices of students in terms of what they study, their motivations for study as well, especially the role of humanities, which don't uh, bring you to employability, and if they do, they don't uh, make you earn a lot of money, right? Uh, so this is any 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 experiences from other countries about the passivity of students or concerns about jobs and how it uh, influences the choices of students. Okay, and let me just see if they, we have we haven't had that little square there at the back yet. The lady was speaking. We have there uh, somebody. Just a second. Hello, um, my name is Amalia. I'm from Malaysia. 
Um, I think it uh, comes with the culture of uh, my country that um, students um, basically are practically shy to speak out. So it's it's something that um, probably is built in the culture of um, uh, my country. Yeah? Um, now they they will only usually they will speak up when they are asked to speak up, and um, it's very quite rarely in the class that they will come out and volunteer and say something. So it's it, they have we have to put them in a in a situation or different environment to let them to be different than themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's it comes back to this uh, conception of students. Is it a pupil? A child, uh, or is there, a, or are we, uh, me as a teacher and somebody as a student, are we more on equal? What is our power balance in in a sense? Uh, I think in, in Malaysia, it's it's how the um, children are brought up to be always um, be, um, I would say, look up to the elders. Yes, and um, you know, it's I think it's kind of uh, sometimes. Um, taboo to say to speak up more than the adults yes. right so i think it's it's, it's it comes with the culture but um, we're trying to change that in the um, higher education okay and we, we want them to be different when they go out to to um, and, and hire in, in their career and something mm -hmm. this is to prepare them for their job mm -hmm. uh, we, we always told them that um, it's, it's not going to help you uh, when you go for interviews not to be brave to speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was an undergraduate student uh, in Maribor in Slovenia, this was just after the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, and I was a student of economics, we were 600 in my cohort, and we were usually divided in three groups, uh, in two groups, 300 in the classroom A and 300 in classroom B. Uh, that was usually, and how much, I was, at that time, uh, I was quite a good student and, and more extrovert, so I would be more likely to talk. But it was not something that was invited, neither by the professor at the front, but it was not even appreciated by my colleagues. Uh, and why it was not appreciated by the colleagues? Because the belief was that anything that is being said in class has to be written down and then memorized. So the more you pose the questions, the more it has to be written down and memorized. Uh, so you don't ask the questions, you know. Uh, stop asking this question, I would get these looks. Uh, stop with this. So, so you stop because there is this social pressure. And uh, again, people wonder whether the student-centered approach can be done in the mass or massive or large classroom. Is it possible to have a discussion like this? I always say it is it's just much harder. Uh, and one thing that works usually is peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. If students are shy and if they are told uh, and they, if they have this uh, um, inherent need to be observant and respectful authority and not question authority, they will talk to their peers. It's a beautiful method of uh, putting uh, students into the groups and have them teach each other or have them discuss. And that usually works. And then somebody from that group of five or six will be reporting back to the classroom of 300 or 400 or how many you have it. So there are methods to, act, to, to work on student-centered approaches, even in the massive uh, uh, classrooms. But of course, it's part of uh, the relationship, the underlying relationship, and, and the invitations from the professors to create this kind of a uh, atmosphere where students are feeling free to contribute and are invited to contribute. It is the question about partnership, making students feel that they are co-producers of knowledge, not only those that are sitting passively and the knowledge is transmitted onto them. And it's really in the hands of the professor, the lecturer, to create that. And that's the difficult part because not everyone is 100% convinced and it's terribly hard. I mean, for me, the easy part would be, I go through my slides, uh, you ask the three questions or four questions afterwards, and then I, you know, I'm done, you are done, uh, and I go home. And I could have done this even from sitting from my study via the, via the, in, uh, the internet, and we would have a bit of an exchange. But so much happens if we actually have this conversation. I have learned so much from these little examples, Japan and Italy and Malaysia and, 
and uh, Libya and, and everywhere. It's, uh, and, and from, from the colleagues who have experienced the African and the European uh, systems, it's, it's a completely different experience. And so much we have managed to tease out from this discussion, the belonging issue and the liability and this legal relationships and the status of the students uh, and the conceptions of students. I mean, all of that comes from the conversation. So this is, this is I think, uh, the magic of the approach. Uh, I, I will be moving out and ending now, just uh, with, uh, with two things that I don't need to speak much about because you have spoken already, but let me just uh, recap. And that is the issue about students belonging. Students belonging uh, to their academic communities or their academic community. Uh, and it's really about we have heard it before already here about being defined by the university, feeling proud to be part of that academic community, uh, feeling that they matter for the university. I matter for my university. I'm an important part for my university. I own my university psychologically. And here is the question, is this, this relationship, are, are these notions still possible when students are paying as well? That's something for you to ponder about, uh, for all of us actually. Does that change in, in when we have full tuition fee paying students? Does, do those uh, uh, senses of uh, intimacy or uh, allegiance to the university change? And if they change, in which way they change? And what do they mean for the students' behavior and the relations to their universities? But at the, at, the, at the end of the day, or at the bottom line, students' belonging or sense of belonging to their universities is essential for many things. It is essential for their success in studies, and studies and numbers of studies have shown this, especially the Tinto and the, uh, and, and, and the Aston, for their positive academic experience uh, together. For their retention, they're less likely to drop out and leave the university if they feel this belonging to the university. Uh, and they experience more well-being. They are more happier. They are even healthier. That's some of the thing in the business studies they have done. Uh, they study that those students that feel that they belong, that they are part of the community, uh, have less problems, not only mental, but physical health in general. So it, so it, is, uh, it is essential. And then, if we have that, and we are coming to the comment that we have heard at the beginning from the lady at the back, if the students have this belonging, they will be willing to do for the universities more than only what is in their immediate self-interest. They might, they will be thinking about their university, as the colleague said here before, as their home that they belong uh, to. And uh, for your home, you don't only do that, what, what is good for you, but you do things that are good for people that you live with, right? For your family as well. Um, so it's about acting for the communities or the community uh, beyond the self-interest only, for the communal interest uh, as well. Um, and that's pretty much, that's, uh, this is where I would uh, like to uh, end with. Uh, by way of conclusion, and this is only questions now for the final moments of the discussion. Does the situation where students are paying and paying a lot of money change this? Uh, in any ways, uh, and uh, how does the culture of individualism and consumerism alter the students uh, belonging to universities and the entire studentship or being a student? How does the question about the dire economic circumstances and the worry about finding the jobs and unemployability changes studentship, being a student? the choices the students make in terms of choices of the subjects um, and what they expect to get out of universities, more vocational recitations. What, what will that mean for the humanities and the future of humanities? We had a discussion earlier on. So those are some of the open questions. I do not have answers and probably we have different stories happening in different, and, and with that, I would like to open the discussions. And I have already one comment there. I'll leave you with uh, Dewey uh, uh, to, uh, at the very end and, and uh, hope to hear more questions and uh, comments. Um, yes, first I'd like to thank you so much for your amazing, actually, presentation. And uh, as a professor at Cairo University from political science background, I'd like to just ask you, you know, just, uh, 
um, a question that I cannot answer it, actually. You know, just the, do you think out of your experience uh, that if the students are not satisfied academically can be or can engage in um, social activities in their societies or not? In other meaning, you know, just in other words, do you think that is a, rela a link or a relationship between academic satisfaction and social engagement? Interesting question. Uh, very interesting question. Maybe two two answers uh, that I would uh, that I would have. One thing is what I when I in some of my studies and and especially the one that my students did last year is those that have not been academically fulfilled. They often have channeled their energy in extracurricular activities and have found uh, and have been socially engaged in a different way and they have found their purpose of studentship in that. One example, um, somebody was doing literature, not really happy uh, what they were, too much theory, I don't know what, uh, newspaper. All the energy and, and the entire studentship of that student, the, all of the activities were dedicated to that newspaper. Uh, a bunch of, I happened to go to a conference and somebody uh, Sitting in a hotel, uh, there was an engineer wanted to have a talk, uh, not going to the conference, and uh, said, "Oh, you study students well, you know." I didn't do anything in my classrooms when I was student. In fact, it was so bad. There was a five of us guys in the same engineering department. We just spent the entire day at home, and we were doing, we were setting up some computer programs, and eventually, we actually made a company out of it. So. That was his experience of being a student. Um, so I think that, I mean, in the ideal world, we would hope that uh, academic experience will be the one that will drive the innovation uh, um, and it will give students preparedness that they will do things afterwards. And this is what we strive for because we feel then we can somehow control it and we, know, we as teachers, we know what are the good foundations uh, for later. But it's not the end of the day if the energy is channeled somewhere else as well. Hopefully those two worlds will be connected, right? Hopefully the student that is uh, active in the newspaper will also find enrichment within the classroom and bring some of the things in, inside or not. So that's one of the, that's one of the story. The other more negative side of the story is, I'm so unhappy, this is such a, I'm not getting anything out of it, why would I bother being a student at all? And this is really where the story of the dropout happens. And that's more usual story, right? Because not everyone has this disposition of finding newspaper or debate club or starting a business. The usual is, why bother? Why bother uh, investment of time, uh, family is waiting, results, nothing's happening. And, uh, and often, I mean, there is investment, uh, not only financial investment, it's investment of time. While at the same time, I could have picked up the job and, and try to uh, start on with the story. So academic uh, dissatisfaction is a bad thing. It's a big problem. Some of the best to drop out. Some of the best to drop out for that reason, exactly. This is where you lose them, the best of them. Uh, for something else, yeah, precisely. Uh, and history has seen, and not all of them become Bill Gates, right? Not all of them, <laughs> right? It's uh, the story ends for them, and and they will be feeling implications later on um, uh, because uh, uh, there is a mass high education. Uh, one, maybe just one little, uh, one little story. There's also a lot of discussion about cheating and pl plagiarism. There was a colleague of mine from Czech Republic who wrote a wonderful article published in the journal that I edit, uh, European Journal of Higher Education, which he entitled, Students Cheat When They Are Cheated. When they're cheated, it means that they have not been offered quality education. They have been given uh, the exams that have been given the all of the years before, there have been even exams which are multiple question exams uh, where they were asked to memorize things from years before. Um, they have not been given a chance, they have not been assessed in a way that would be formative, that would help them develop. They have been checked um, and they have felt that the knowledge that they were given was not useful, it was not helpful, it was, uh, it was not satisfied. They were academically dissatisfied, as you have mentioned before. So this is yet another story to that question. More. We have still, can I have five more minutes, uh, Ferit? And then we, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, the boss said. So anything else? 
anything else that we would like to open for the final moment? Maybe, maybe uh, there is a comment that... Comment. Yes. Maybe a comment that it is better, I think that it is better because I, I, I used to teach the higher study students that it is better, it's much better not to compile up uh, academic information to students' mind that they have to do this and this and this because you have to pass successfully. So in case of doing this, of course, that there's no uh, positive, let us say, or let us say active uh, reaction from the students. Always they are passive because they are thinking only how to pass successfully, mm. how to mm. manage this. So mm. I think that it is better not to compile up all the uh, academic information to my students. Mm. Not to, not to, and, and there is a question. Assessment is a big area. I'm sure you think about it as well. How to assess students so that the assessment is actually be encouraging, strengthening the learning exactly. rather than just checking what the students have learned. Definitely. And there, there, there is a literature on student-centered assessment, a formative assessment. What do you do? You know, don't give, uh, don't give just a big exam at the very end of the year. Give several of a smaller tests so the students are. You, you know the tricks, uh, but that. That's part of the story. Anything else before uh, uh, one more comment here? Yes, please. I think it would just be more of a question, really. Um, with the change in economic direction, uh, especially where we are uh, in Europe and, and around it, I'm beginning to feel a sense of despondency amongst my students. It's more like, why are we doing this? Uh, those that have done it don't even have a job yet. So why do I have to go through these rigors? Is there anything we can do to address this? This is a big question, and it's uh, it's Europe. I mean, it's 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 everywhere. Students are worried about their jobs. Um, I think the only thing that I come with is is helping students also to think creatively and out of the box. I mean, maybe if nothing else works, entrepreneurship might be one of the things uh, that we can pass on to them. I, I do not, I mean, most of the stories, of course, depends on the macroeconomic developments and what the governments will do to create more jobs. But one of the things that uh, happens when the big industries fail, it's the medium and small sized uh, companies that might might do something that might make a trick. And if we can help our students uh, on the way of thinking about it, not only to become employees of the companies, but maybe, maybe also think that there is a chance of them to have a startup, uh, that's something. But of course, it depends on the fields uh, and uh, humanities are particularly uh, suffering from, from the current uh, macroeconomic situation. I have to stop. I cannot uh, extend. I would like to thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. You were most uh, enriching for me. Thank you.